So as I started this evening, of course, I said it's going to be a brilliant evening. We have uh, a power-packed evening in store for you. And uh, well, the action starts right now because we have a thought-provoking panel discussion coming up. Our topic tonight is Cradle to Cradle Design, the new smart green print for architecture. We have uh, some eminent panelists here with us. In fact, we're honored to have them. And I'd like to begin by welcoming our moderator for the session who will be Mr. R. Subramanian, Managing Director, St. Gobain India Private Limited Glass Business. And of course, a few seconds while we set up for what promises to be a truly exciting panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us as our esteemed panelists, Mr. Dikshu Kukreja, Proprietor CP Kukreja and Associates, Please do join us on stage, sir. Ms. Sonali Rastogi, founder partner, More Food Genesis. Mr. Tanme Tataghat, director, environmental design solutions. Mr. Pradeep Sachdeva, principal architect, Pradeep Sachdeva Design Associates. Mr. Pranav Ansal, VC Ansal API. A very warm welcome to all our panelists and, of course, our moderator. And so, it's over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Cradle to Cradle Design, the new smart green print for architecture. Cradle to Cradle Design, we know what it's all about. Sustainability, another take on sustainability, a perspective of perpetual reuse, of intelligent design, sticking to the integrity and quality of what is desired waste-free system and maximizing values on various dimensions, economic, ecological, and social. And helping us to navigate us through this topic will be the eminent panel that I have here with me, Ms. Sonali Rastogi, founder partner Morphogenesis, who has been deeply involved in shaping the Griha rating system and has won numerous reward, awards to her name in architecture and green leadership. We hope to hear about the Griha rating system more today. Mr. Pradeep Sachdeva at the left corner of Pradeep Sachdeva Associates, the mastermind behind public spaces like Delhi Heart and Garden of Five Senses in Delhi who believes in contextual and sensitive development of projects. We had in the morning, sir, a discussion on public domain, and many people from the audience refer to your work after the meeting to me. Mr. Pranav Ansel, Vice Chairman Ansel API, who is attributed with heralding the retail revolution in Delhi with the Ansel Plaza chain of malls and also the development of green housing projects, such as the Essentia Gurgaon. Mr. Dikshu Kukreja, Vice uh, CEO of CP Kukreja Associates, who has done extraordinary work on development, several awarded institutional campuses, Shiv Nadar University, Gautam Buddha University in Greater Noida and the Central University in Kashmir. And finally, Mr. Tanmay Tatagat, Partner Environmental Design Solutions, who has contributed enormously to the development of the Energy Conservation Building Code and the Eco Housing Program. What I what I propose to do is have a series of questions and answers, the panel discussion for about half an hour, and then we will 
we can have question and answers with the audience. So those of you who have points to make, questions to ask, please note it down. It's late in the day, so the shorter and more specific the question, the better it is. Setting the ball rolling, I'd start off with uh, Sonali Rastogi. New smart green print for architecture. As an architect, what do you feel are the priorities for India? Um, that's an extremely loaded statement with a lot of very important words. Um, I'll just start with uh, what I often find myself saying, which is the word smart. Uh, and I always wonder that why do we feel the need to say it so much because uh, is there an option to be non-smart? Um, and so really smart today, a new blueprint, I really think it's not about new, it's a progression of uh, a natural instinct to preserve, organize and optimize resources. And if a digital world today is giving us the tools to optimize and manage them in a way which is more productive, then if that is termed smart, then absolutely smart is the way to go. But essentially, it starts with, uh, it starts with a larger, broader word, which, whether which um, then gets a subword like cradle to cradle or it gets smart. It's the larger discipline of sustainability. And um, I, my, my personal journey has uh, taken me from early 90s to now from green being like really what is green like it's some fuzzy word is it like a terrace garden or what is it or uh, and you know ever since there have been many tag words to what is green what is sustainable what is smart but essentially I consider it a responsibility as somebody who is playing a small role in generating a built environment that whatever you do should be done smartly in ways to just preserve, conserve, and redistribute and reorganize resources so that we optimize them and not be wasteful. What the paradigm of that time is will define what is defined as wasteful. And I think that needs to be understood. So is it that we are talking about when oil is the deciding factor? Or today, is it when we are talking about when solar energy is on the verge or has already made a huge breakthrough? And then we have to consider the built environment from that perspective. So it's really smart is about staying focused on what is the, what is the call of the day as per the paradigm that we are stepping into. I'll, I'll move to Pradeep. The, the open spaces, the social spaces, they matter. How, how good are we and how, or rather, how can we be better in incorporating them into the design so that it's not just the built environment but also the space between the built environment which comes into our priorities, your uh, take on it. I don't think we are doing enough. Uh, it's one thing to develop projects like the Lehard but the most important open space is streets. And we've been trying for about a decade and a half and find it's a struggle. It's, we tend to be very car-centric, not people-focused. Even in a city like Delhi, the pedestrian infrastructure is very, very poor and basic. I'm not even counting the NDMC area because it really is not real India. And I think we need to talk beyond Delhi and very, very limited interventions are being done despite quite a lot of people working, trying to work with, you know, the most important is the state with whom we want to work and who can deliver rather than say a private sort of entrepreneur. So we've tried to have a lot of workshops with the institutions like PWD and so on. But I think a lot of a lot more capacity building needs to be done there and sensitization that there is a need. It doesn't have to cost anything because money is anyway being spent on public infrastructure. It just needs to be more friendlier and usable. And if that starts happening, our cities will start becoming much more livable. 
Dikshu. Um, the Cradle to Cradle talks about the larger social, economic, and ecological uh, values. More and more people are talking about the human comfort uh, aspect of it. How can we incorporate that into the sustainability agenda, the human comfort aspect? Uh, it's good to see quite a few architect friends here in the audience. And I think this is really a pressing issue what we are discussing today. But before I directly answer your question, I think one important aspect is that there's one thing that we sit and just talk about this, and we talk and we talk, and then slowly maybe one day it'll take shape. But I think time is running out in a sense if we look at what's going on with our environment, what we are reading every single day in the paper, including the Economic Times, about what is happening, Delhi being the most polluted city in the world. So I will just say in a minute here, that one is that we deliberate on things to be done, but how, does, how do we make it happen? And for us to make it happen, for me, the simple answer is that we will have to build it into the economy. We will have to build it into a credit system, an incentive system in the building industry. By which I mean that we have to see that if these kind of initiatives have to be encouraged, whether it is, of course, green building, which has come up over the years, but also C2C. If we have to build up this initiative, then we must make sure that incentives are given to whichever user wants to do it. Today, I'm sure many of you will agree in the audience also, who are associated with the green building, green building revolution, that when it comes to deciding whether A versus B, what strategy to use, Immediately, there's a cost-benefit analysis done by the, uh, by the client and the team. Whether it's a developer, whether it's the government, they immediately want to see a cost-benefit analysis. We'll go for A system versus B. What is the running cost and what is the payback period? So in that sense, I think it's very important that even in the C2C concept, we start introducing this into a system. So whether it's the statutory bylaws, whether it is incentives in terms of additional built-up area, or any other mechanism, we need to start looking at that simultaneously. Now to answer your question, I would say there are two aspects we should keep in mind. One is the tangible benefits that come through such a system. Tangible benefits can be, okay, we have reduced this much air conditioning load, we have used so many more, we have used XYZ, recycled material, etc., etc. But we should not forget that there is an intangible benefit to this as well, which is what you were asking, I guess. And the intangible benefit is that if we use, there is so much that has happened in this country in the last 15 to 20 years about just aping a certain technology, aping even architectural styles, a lot of times of the West. But why do we forget that there is recycling or cradle to cradle concept also in terms of our culture, in terms of our art, in terms of our vernacular systems. So if we can use those as well, I think there's a strong pitch for C2C in that. Thank you. Uh, I'll move to Pranav. So Dikshu made a passionate case for uh, economic viability to be brought out, cost benefit, and uh, matters to builders, doesn't it? As developer, what's your take on cradle to cradle and sustainability? Okay, before I come to the subject, I want to uh, talk about a technology conference I attended about two months ago. And there was one sentence which sticks to my mind and I want to link it with what's happening today. The person said that when we were kids and when I was a kid, the talk used to be roti, kapda or makan. He said now the talk is roti, makan or Wi-Fi because that was a technology conference. And I think in today's context, it should be roti, makan, Wi-Fi, or sustainability. I think it's a no-brainer, and what we are discussing is something, you know, which we all, and especially the audience here, understands the importance of it. Um, I want to mention a particular case of ours. We bought about 200 acres of land in a city called Bhilwada, about 600 kilometers from here. And in that city, uh, if any of you have ever been there, there is no water in that city till today. The water comes by train from Chambal and two, three areas close by. So when we were going for approvals, we asked the uh, UIT commissioner that how will we get water? 
So he said it's been 50 or 60 years, this city doesn't have water. So, you know, since then, I was very disturbed that, you know, you have a city of about 200,000 people and there's no water. So even today in that city, there is three or four hours of water is maximum what people get. And that also by train. And there is no arrangement being even thought of or even, you know, uh, they have no plans of giving water to them. So when we talk about sustainability and issues, you know, in some cities of India, I would say 60 to 70 percent of India, people are still grappling with things like water, sanitation, uh, you know, issues like these. And, and they are just getting more and more grave and serious. So I think this is a very, very big issue. And today what's happening in Chennai or what's happening in Delhi is, is very, very serious. And all of us sitting here are responsible and, you know, we must make sure that we deliver more of it. So coming specifically to us, you know, when I saw this, uh, we worked very closely with Griha. And we came up with the first horizontal residential township in Gurgaon, which has been rated by Griha. And uh, it is totally green. We've already got rating and more than 300 families already living there. So the benefits, some of the benefits that they've got is they've got lower energy bills, they've got more water, but that's only the development I'm, I'm doing. All the around their buildings and I don't know how much of, you know, green and how green they are. But generally sustainability is the way forward, is the way today. It's not even the way forward, it's the way today. And I think uh, media is doing a lot of uh, good by talking about it every day. So I think we all should do whatever we can you know, to arrive at it. And your company is doing great work in terms of the innovation and what they are doing. So I think we all should work towards it. Thanks, Pranab. I'll, I'll take the ball now to Tanmay. Um, so we had the architect's take. We had the, uh, the developer's take. Government has a lot to do, and usually it does it through regulation. And ECBC, it's, it's still mainly a guideline, but it was really path-breaking work. Um, after having worked on bringing it out and quite some time has elapsed, where do you think the Energy Conservation Building Code stands today? And what more needs to be done to get it into the agenda of C2C, cradle to cradle? Well, I, I think uh, there are two or three aspects we need to understand about uh, cradle to cradle and what it means in terms of uh, the kinds of things that are happening with the policy and regulation. First of all, we don't need to really, uh, you know, preach to the choir here and talk about how important and what is the benefit of a cradle to cradle approach. Uh, in fact, I mean, I'm honored that, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jain, uh, Dr. Khosla here, who are the pioneer of, of these kinds of approaches to looking at the complete uh, life cycle of a product, systems, and uh, to borrow uh, Mr. Santanam's word, uh, looking at it in an innovative way for the Indian context, and which is where we're coming from, that if you look at the economic imperative, there is no way that the cradle to cradle approach will ever be mainstream. Because it is in nobody's economic interest to just say, okay, I'll look at the complete life cycle, environmental, social, economic impact of a product. Wherever it has succeeded, to some extent, it is by regulation. Unfortunately. But this is how it is. This is how we are. So, uh, therefore, it has to be ingrained in, in a lot of uh, policies and regulations in a certain way. But at the same time, there is one aspect of this which is very contextual right now since all this stuff is happening in Paris and there is a debate on what India should do, which is from the employment and economic aspects of doing this new generation, new industry, new kind of a green uh, ecosystem of jobs that can only come if you look at it this way because otherwise we'll be importing technologies, products, systems, maybe setting up a factory here to manufacture it and that's about it. Whereas again if I look at the examples of work done where 
if you look at the Indian way of, say, making a building and look at what are the advantages of the best in the Western world, and again, I'm going back to what Mr. Santanam said, there is an innovation that connects the two because we have the learning from there. I can foresee that we will have a new generation of industries that will cater only to this. And finally, construction sector, one of the largest employment generators, has the ability to disseminate this money and the econom economic power of this to the last person who actually makes the building. So a building code, for example, on its own will never look at what happens to where the brick is made because then it becomes so complex. Then, you know, you're asking an architect to figure out, you know, not just to make a wall, but then to look at, you know, uh, where the soil was dug, where the brick was made. It's not possible to do that. You know, a few projects that we are fortunate to work on many commercial projects that actually look at it in our office. But that's not how the business is usually. So I would say anything to do with building code regulations should uh, be seen as a component. And we should never look at looking at one regulation that encompasses everything because it becomes too complex. So therefore, the environment regulations for, say, product declaration, which is a standard in Europe now, which is also becoming a standard in US uh, for a new generation of building, uh, green building standards, is something that we should look at seriously. Whereas it is required that any construction product should have a completely third party audited environmental impact certified. So at least that means the architect doesn't have to worry about it, the builder doesn't have to worry, there is somebody who's taken care that at least the product is safe and works well, and then you worry about the other aspects of the thing. So government is but one building block, maybe a necessary building block, but the superstructure has to come through the others. Griha, I come back to you, Sonali. Griha rating, um, where, what else do you think it needs to have if you were to think of a Griha 2.0? Okay, so um, as a practice, we've been uh, involved, and uh, Manit a little bit more than me, we've been involved uh, with not just with well with sustainable thinking and rating systems are imp are very very important because there is uh, one change when there is a systemic shift towards sustainable thinking there is another one which you're able to gauge what you do today talking about smart you mean we all have we count steps on our phone how much do we walk and it surprises us look we're not walking 10,000 we're actually walking 2,000 steps in a day we think we're active people but we are not so rating kind of plays that watch card role. And it's a checklist. So it's, it's, you're able to gauge, oh, really? Am I really not being that sustainable? So it kind of gives you, OK, if I can not do this, maybe I do that. But it gives you a way of, um, I think, um, a watchdog on your own conscience. And for me personally, uh, that is one of the most important roles that a rating system plays. And then if it is a metric that proves what you're thinking and what you're doing to a client or to a market or it becomes a USP for somebody else who wants to be conscious of the fact and believe that they're part of a greener way of existence, then it is absolutely necessary to have these green systems. But having said that, I still go back to the fact that it is, um, whether it is Leeds or Griha or Brihams or any other green system, they are all a corollary of first a systemic green thinking. And that comes from adopting whatever the paradigm is bringing towards that. And today it is the technology of smart and marrying it to the absolutely thousands of years of knowledge that has allowed various regions to actually have to be occupied by people because they have circumvented um, limitations of material. They have uh, uh, dealt with scarcity. And those basic logical approaches to how we live and how we build combined together with uh, today's resource availability, today's technology, within a format of a rating system is really what a rating system is about. And um, that is why I personally would support a rating system that has grown out of this system that we are building in. Uh, however, any system that brings in other aspects of it or adapts to our Indian built uh, environment is absolutely as welcome. So, uh, 
Rating systems give a metric so that the discussion is uh, quantitative. Third party testing so that it's not dependent on subjective views but there is a third party view to it. And the entire thing has to, has to be in the form of uh, 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 a trend, a thinking, change in the thinking and our culture is very much reflecting that from the past. So that's, that's, that's what I took from that. Pradeep, I come to you now. Um, how do we take this entire movement forward in terms of a collaboration between industry, students, government, so that we take this movement forward and uh, what, has, what has actually been achieved with IGBC, with Griha and various, uh, various active people in design environment and developers, how do we take it forward with all, as, all parts of the society? One, I think, is that the green building movement in the country has reached a certain level of acceptance as well as maturity very rapidly. It's also a global trend. It's, it's the way uh, people are being taught. Uh, in 10 years, you can see a huge difference in this country in terms of the rating, the amount of understanding people have, the number of professionals who are trained to assist you in building uh, sustainably is tremendous. So I think the tough part is over thanks to you know, people like Dr. Jain and so on who pioneered this and then Griha. So I think what you need to do is perhaps take it to the next level to make things even more contextual than they are. They are fairly relevant to the Indian conditions at the moment. Uh, and I think the youngsters are clued on to it. It's, I mean, my reservation is that the number of design schools and engineering colleges that we have in the country today, perhaps you don't have adequate number of teachers who are properly trained. The students are bright. The young people catch on things very, very quickly. So. I think we need to address the issue of teachers rather than the students. The students are much more tech savvy, they can you know, download an app, the teacher still may not be doing that. Teach, teach the teachers first. Teach the teachers first, I, I think. I take it to you, Pranav. Uh, you're of course a very important developer. You also run uh, the largest private school. What's your take on teach the teachers and teach the students aspect? I think teaching the youth, uh, especially the new and upcoming architects, is very, very important because once they learn it from the beginning, they'll take it forward. So uh, we run uh, Sushant School of Architecture, which is the, we've been the number one private architecture school for the last five years. So what we've done is in the panel, we, in our uh, governing committee, we have people like Sonali, Manet, Dikshu, they are right on the panel and, and several other prominent architects. So they keep giving us, you know, they are the ones who drive it, not us. So they keep, especially Madhat is very, very deeply involved. So they talk to the students, they talk to the teachers. Then we have uh, foreign landscapists and architects coming who work with us in our projects. They talk to, we call them and they give lectures to the students, they talk to them. We have permanent architects from the country and overseas, like Hafiz contractor and all their regular visitors. Plus. Uh, in our school, we take uh, students to the sites and they are actually taught by our engineers, you know, how to work on site, how to, you know, make it friendly. So we are doing a bit and I'm sure there's many more things we can do. But I think uh, all the schools, all the colleges should talk about it. I think even in schools, why only in colleges? I think even in schools, when kids are young, when they're growing up, there should be a case on sustainability and, you know, the issues that we are facing. Because as the responsible people, we have to teach them since, you know, since they get into school. So it's, it should be a subject, actually. Thanks. I, I, I take the ball to Dikshu. Um, so it, it started off as a trend, and it's gathering momentum. Ten years from now, how many design studios do you see using C2C as a standard? This is, of course, a promising trend, and I don't think there's any looking back on it. But if we really wanted to even gather more steam than what 
uh, we anticipate it will be, the way it's going, I think it has to be completely a change in mindset in society all the way through. You were just now talking about teach the teachers, but I think what has happened in schools with certain aspects, if you see about environment uh, sensitivity, whether it has been about say no to crackers or say no to plastics and campaigns like that, I think children in that sense are the focal point if we really start young. Uh, at that point, if the next generation uh, is already sensitized to uh, the environment, to smart green cities shaping the future, etc., I think that will be a very promising trend. Because tomorrow it's not just about architects and designers, it is about your clients, it is about everybody else, all the other cogs in the wheel that fit into what ends up creating habitat. So if everyone is sensitive, somewhere subconsciously, I think that's going to make a big difference. So that is important. Having said that, once that happens, I think uh, your question about wh where do we see design schools 10 years from here, I would say why design schools? It would be schools per se. It would be just the way we learn civics as a subject in school. Civics and environment really go hand in hand today. So I think it's a much broader picture, much broader awareness that needs to come, has already come, and can build steam onwards. It's yeah. a comprehensive answer. We'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, can we have some mics circulated, please? Questions only, please. Uh, no uh, opinions. Questions? Any questions? Maybe Dr. Jain can ask us a question. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jain has all the answers. <laughs> Okay, it's, ah, is that a hand? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this question is to Dikshu. Uh, since you're doing so many buildings and you've already been, uh, you know, very conscious about designing, sus you know, sustainable buildings, now this new concept of C2C, how will you see that they are implemented nicely you know, in the future proje uh, projects and nicely among your fellow architects? How would you uh, see that this scheme is implemented? So uh, I answered that a bit in, in my opening remarks that C2C is a very important concept. There's no doubt about it. And I think in terms of where we see how impl uh, to implement it in our projects, like Tanmay was mentioning a little while earlier, that it's going to do, it has a lot to do with the team uh, that you work with. For example, even whether it's Greha or IGBC or the entire rating process, a lot, uh, most of us architects work with experts like uh, Tanmay or Selvarasu sitting right next to you and people like that to fit into the system. So same way, I think uh, uh, the same experts or a new breed of younger experts will come in who will be more uh, savvy with the C2C con uh, concept, will be more uh, aware of it, and will be able to guide people like us on how to integrate it with buildings. But it is a concept here to stay. And I think it has a lot to do with mankind itself. I mean, I, I, the uh, term itself, if you see how it's coined, as a man, as a, as a mankind, uh, we begin in the cradle and we go back to the cradle, right? And it, in a very environment friendly manner. So in that sense, I think buildings also can be done that way. We will have to integrate some of these systems into our projects, including of course the uh, heart of this concept, which is recycling. That has to come in. And as far as the other architects are concerned, I think it's about awareness. And besides awareness, like I said, if there are incentives built into the system, I'm sure it's something people will quickly uh, ad adopt to. Uh, I, have a small, I have a question. Hello. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is very simple. You know, there are certain technologies which do not go in hand with the basic sciences of architectures. Now, when we talk of some sciences, 
which are not taught fully in the universities, how can you uh, get to those sciences unless and until you get to those professionals or the companies? So what is your you know, coordination with those companies or the professionals? Can you get to the question? Um, th this is addressed to the panel as a whole? As a whole. You know, there are certain sciences which are not basic sciences, but they are like geology, you know, water supply, uh, the technologies which are incoming. Now, those sciences has to be told to the architect by the companies and the professionals or the people who are in the business. How far the architects and the professionals are coordinating in this country? And how is your experience in that stance? Okay, so one of the things, uh, we've talked about education of children, uh, about sustainability, but I think one of the things that we need to think about uh, very strongly in India at the moment is this, uh, a continuous education program. So as all of us professionals who graduate from college at a particular age, as I keep saying, paradigms change. We learned architecture in a different time and where we were discussing how to save energy in terms of oil. Today we are talking about renewable energy the whole time. So the whole paradigm of energy discussion has changed. Similarly, how does one keep up to date? So what you are saying is absolutely right. And I think rather than being um, your resource base only being uh, that manufacturing company that has managed to reach out to you, and not everybody is capable have, of reach, outreach to that level, uh, I think a continuous education program for professionals must be designed where they, ha um, they are not only exposed to new technologies, alternate technologies, but uh, there is also, this is the world of metrics, I used the word metrics before, also uh, the, it, there is a meter for judging how up to date you are. And I think it's extremely important, uh, without that, I think it's death of a professional. So thank you for bringing that up. No, uh, one, I'll, 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 uh, one intervention I would like to say. I'm not talking of the, uh, you know, uh, education at a lower level. I'm talking when a company is making a product by convergence of lot of sciences, when that has to be explained to an architect or to the people, you know, who are building, uh, like uh, any innovative company. So when it comes to you, it has to take little time for you to understand and how you people are coordinating with those companies and is there any a platform where the exchange of these ideas are taken simultaneously or uh, it is just we, uh, the companies have to call all the architects and they have to explain, it's a big exercise. So uh, in, in uh, Singapore and other countries, they have the, they call the technologies people, the companies people and they give, uh, you know, lectures for those uh, product, uh, whereas in India we don't do it. That is what is my question. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just add a little bit, maybe it may partially address the point you're raising. Uh, uh, from Segobay we do, uh, we spend a lot on uh, knowledge and skill building. So we have, for example, uh, Glass Academy. It's an independent uh, uh, entity run by an independent board. All Segobay does is provide the funds. And Glass Academy actually seeks to teach practicing architects and builders things about glass, not Sengoban, but about glass. The glass can be made by anybody, but about glass. Not just the glass which we make, which is actually the raw glass, but also the processed glass, also about fabrication and so on. It also has a skill building where we try to teach people about handling of glass, about fixing of glass and so on. We have a similar academy as part of the GIPROC uh, work, which is known as the GIPROC Academy. So that's, that's one part of it, our attempt to kind of standardize it, uh, provide it in a public platform, put it out there in terms of e-learning and so on. There's another experience that I had as part of Glazing Society and Tanmay would, uh, would know about it. One of the issues that we faced with ECBC implementation was many of the people who were required to use it did not, uh, it, it's quite involved. So we said that apart from an aware, awareness creation uh, 
uh, program, let's look at workshops. So we did a kind of workshop and with the tip sheets, which was fantastic. And it's a one day workshop. So there's half a day of, uh, you know, somebody who kind of handholds you through the main parts of the point system and what you need to do. And the second half of the day, you actually get together and try to solve a problem. Of course, it's, it's too small a time, but people get a flavor. It's called the NEO program, and then we are now launching the NEO 2. So this is one platform, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit aware of what you're saying. I don't know whether it's the same thing, but in UK, for example, the architectural society, they, they insist on the architects attending such programs, practicing architect, and getting themselves recertified. I think those kind of initiatives in India would be, a, would be greatly welcome. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know if this kind of answers your your question and what uh, Sonali has said, I think they go together. Okay, uh, last question. There's somebody there, yes, the gentleman in uh, the turban. Ah, it's Sharanjit Singh. Uh, the smallest question, we do so much work on sustainability, cradle to cradle, anything for the poorest of the poor, the laborer who lives in a hutment is also a part of the society and are we doing something, the architects, the planners, or making a really economical house which is sustainable and which looks after this overall concept of the society. Thank you. I think that's a very, very important point you've raised. And uh, yes, it is sometimes ironical that the people who really build these buildings, really build them, they are uh, forbidden from entering these buildings, perhaps this one also being one amongst them. So uh, I think one of the trends that has started, again through government policies and in initiatives, is the affordable housing. Of course, in areas like metropolitan cities, etc., by the sheer land costs and everything else attached to it, it's more uh, if I can call it in a system wise, it's more lower middle income or um, lower middle income or middle income that is reaching it. But the labor class per se, there is a lot of uh, uh, initiatives that are coming in in terms of uh, welfare housing, in terms of EWS housing. And I think what needs to be built into that is the aspect of uh, C2C, the aspect of recyclability, because that will uh, allow costs eventually of such housing, when we call them affordable or economically, for the economically weaker section housing. Uh, it, this recyclable aspect of it can really eventually start build, uh, bringing the costs down of such housing. So it's an important aspect which has so far, whether it's a city like Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, wherever, it's been wished away or forgotten, but it's time, it, it's acknowledged before it leads to, you know, something which is not most desirable in our society. Thank you. <coughs> we are reaching the uh, deadline in terms of time, so thank you, panel. Uh, Sir, I have a one question, if you can take that. Yeah, this way, this way, this way, this way. Yeah, you are looking at the other side. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there, the gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, sir. Okay, so we the are last, last, question. last question. The government which DDA or GDA and everybody builds houses, how this panel can help the, the government that they can use these green initiatives. First of all, when they build a house, the moment you get in, the architect, the, you know, the, we start changing, people start changing it. There is not, they are not using any green initiative as per the DDA is concerned, as per the all. May, of course, the architects, those who are building, the private builders, they are doing it. But the government and the private sector also not using the the green initiative which they are supposed to use it. Solar we have not seen anywhere in Delhi the people using it. Are you doing something for this country for, to get together and make a law and tell the government that they should use these green initiatives? If you see any small hotels which I go around, no STPs are working. They make STPs but they don't work it. In our colonies the water the way we are wasting it, 
we are not recycling that water and reusing it. Maybe the new colonies which are coming up, of course you are building beautiful apartments, you are using that, all the green initiatives, but the private sector, the governments, they are not using it. Where the maximum people are staying in? That's my question. How are you going to help them? I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so, uh, the government, to, to me the government has uh, multiple roles. One is uh, the builder. I mean, today the government of India is probably the biggest builder that we have. And that's where the relevance of something like a Griha rating is, I think, very important because I, I know for a fact that uh, a large part of government ensures that when it builds buildings, it adopts Griha ratings. Government, secondly, as a, as a regulator, we spoke about that uh, with the Tanmay, and I think there again, there has been considerable movement forward. The third is government as a kind of facilitator, you know, which is, a facilitator is a difficult word. I mean, you don't know what's a facilitator. Is a facilitator a platform? Is a facilitator a mediator? I don't know. But government as a facilitator to provide forums, to provide platforms for green and sustainability to move forward. I see there also progress. To your question, uh, private sector, I think the private sector has taken it more as a competitive issue. And I think there is a lot of image attached to it and there is a lot of uh, sincerity with which green is practiced by many of the preeminent builders and developers across India. If your question is, is it 100% there? Of course not. Of course not. There is still a considerable distance to travel. And which brings me really to the, to the concluding remarks which I want to conclude uh, today with, which I think the panel in its own way kind of drove us to thinking. I, I remember reading somewhere long ago that uh, religion is too important to be left to the priests. It's there, it's the concern of entire humanity. I think cradle to cradle, green, sustainability, the architects, the developers, the consultants, they have a role to play, but it really concerns all of us. And with that thought, we will conclude today's meeting and hopefully we will do more about it. Beyond the architects, beyond the developers and beyond the consultants, we as lay people, as consumers, we will do more about cradle and cradle, cradle to cradle and green and sustainability. With that thought, I close today's session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I think that was the perfect end to a brilliant session. Let's have a big round of applause for all our esteemed panelists. Please remain on the stage. I'd like to request Ms. Deepak Lamba and Ms. Eva Mahajan to please join us on stage to felicitate our esteemed panelists. We promised you a thought-provoking session and of course we got a lot of food for thought. So a big thank you to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, love for you to... It's truly been a wonderful session. Wish we could go on, take more questions however, time's up. Mr. Tanmeta Thagat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Sonari Rasogi, please, another big round of applause for all our esteemed panelists for taking our time, sharing their thoughts giving us a lot to think about. And finally, of course, our moderator, Mr. Subramanian, who did a brilliant job taking this session forward. Thank you so much.